got your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, we're looking at Revelation chapter 2 today. Picking up on where we left off well, several weeks ago now, when we looked at Revelation 1, today it's Revelation chapter 2. I think the, the best way to do Revelation is slowly. So we're not doing the whole of chapter 2 today. Amen. We're just doing to the church in Ephesus, which is verses 1, 2 and including verse 7. And that says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And although that's just one letter to one church, there's such a lot of information in that. So we're going to take it very slowly today and go through that verse by verse. Um, last time I spoke on Revelation, I, I did... Um, Obviously, I did Revelation chapter 1. And in chapter 1, we saw um, well, what Revelation is about. We saw different perspectives, different interpretations of Revelation. Uh, there was the historicist, uh, the futurist, the preterist, and the uh, idealist interpretation, which I went into last time. And we saw how John had a, a vision of the Son of Man. We saw how Jesus was described uh, to John. And chapter 1 of Revelation ended in an unusual way. In chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. And this unique verse gives us an outline for how I think Revelation should be read. There are the things you have seen. There are the things which were passed to John, the things that are, the things that were present to John, and the things that are to take place, the things which are future to John. A lot of revelation is prophecy, and much of it is still future to us as well. And as we read Revelation, we should keep in mind, therefore, that some of these events were past to John, some will describe events at his present time, or maybe our present time, and some will be future even to us today. In Revelation, we have the number seven as a constant theme throughout the book. In biblical numerology, seven is actually a special number. It depicts perfection and completion. Indeed, seven is the number we associate with God. He created the world in seven days, for instance. Uh, later in Revelation, we'll see there are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And now we read the seven churches that, um, that received a letter from God himself. And each of these letters follow a pattern. And the pattern in these letters, it starts off with, firstly, the royal author, God himself, introducing himself, describing himself in terms from chapter 1. Secondly, Jesus declares that he knows 
He knows the situation that church has, uh, has found itself in. He can emphasise or he understands or he can, he can cut to the core of the issue because he knows. And then he introduces this diagnosis of the church's condition, whether it be positive or negative. Thirdly, uh, comfort and commands follow. And fourthly, all the churches are commanded to hear and heed what the letter says before a blessing is promised to the one who conquers, foreshadowing the final visions in chapters 21 and 22. Now, the seven epistles in chapter 2 and 3, and when we say epistles, we think of the letters, we think of the uh, uh, 1 and 2 Peter, we think of the letters to the Ephesians, the Galatians, um, Colossians, we, we think of the letters, but there are actually seven epistles in Revelation. These churches, these letters to the seven churches are all epistles. That just means a letter. And they were seven actual, physical, literal churches that existed in the time of um, in that time in Asia Minor. However, our God is so clever, our God is so powerful, is so wise, is so magnificent that He can actually use something which was relevant and specific to that church at that time and still apply to us today. And even in between them and her and us today, they can actually show church history. It is amazing when you look into these letters. So the seven letters, as well as being to seven churches, which were real churches, and the situation in the letters is relevant to these churches, they were actually uh, representative of seven periods of time in the church age. To explain what I mean, a very famous verse you will have heard, uh, 2 Peter 3.8 says, and I'm sure you will have heard lots of people say this, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And it's interesting that God created the world in seven days. And Bible genealogies tell us that there were roughly 4,000 years between Adam and Christ on the cross. So if we think of the first four days, God created the world in seven days, if we think the first four days as a thousand years each, 4,000 years, that takes us from creation to Christ on the cross. Then we know from Revelation, from later in Revelation, that the millennium, will last for a thousand years, and that would be day seven. So days five and six represent a 2,000 day, uh, a 2,000 year period between Christ and the cross and the millennium. And it's interesting that we're in the year 2020 right now. So I think it's highly likely that we could be right at the very end of day six, or right at the very start of day seven, somewhere around there. In other words, what I'm trying to say is the rapture is very, very close. Mm -hmm. If the millennium, that thousand year period, day seven, and we're right at the end of day six, any day now, perhaps today, who knows? And there's a very curious, but somewhat speculative, um, at least my, my opinion of this may be speculative, verse from Hosea chapter 6, 1 to 2. You don't need to turn to it, but if you want to look at it after, it's Hosea chapter 6, 1 to 2. And that says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Now in context, this verse refers to Israel. But could I suggest that, remember, God being so clever, and verses may have multiple meanings, and it may refer to us Christians as a spiritual Israel, that after two days, those 2,000 years between Christ and the cross, before the millennium, on that third day, he will raise us up. Could this be a, a subtle, hidden reference to a rapture? Maybe, maybe not. It's an interesting thought. 
With Bible prophecy, admittedly, it is easy to become excited and it's easy to look for things which may not be there. But that verse from Hosea, I'm not saying that's what, what is what it means, is a thought. It's an interesting thought. And it's an idea. Um, but it could, it could mean that. Who knows? So the 2,000 year church age, remember the church began, uh, we read about the church beginning in, in the, the, the book of Acts. The, the apostles started to create the church after Christ on the cross. And the church age lasted 2,000 years uh, up until now. And it can be divided into seven parts. Remember the seven churches, the seven letters to the church. Each church representing a period of time in the church age. They're not divided equally, but scholars tend to agree on something as far, uh, which I'm going to outline now, something similar to what I'm about to say. And I admit I'm persuaded by this. I think this is right. The Ephesus church, which is the apostolic church, the church in, in the mold of the apostles, full of zeal, full of um, courage, full of boldness, evangelism, wanting to tell people about Christ. And scholars say that the apostolic church, or the church in Ephesus, represents years AD 30 to AD 100. Then we read about the Smyrna church, which was the persecuted church, and that lasted from AD 100 to 313. A terrible time where Christians were fed to lions and, and had to fight animals and crucified and boiled alive and all sorts of horrible, horrendous things. The Pergamum church is the state church. When Christianity became the official state religion, from AD 313 to 519, uh, 590. Then we have the Thyatira church, the papal church. We start to see Catholicism coming in around this time. 590 to 1517. The Sardis church followed, which was the Reformation, the Reformed church. AD 1517 to 1730. Then we have the Philadelphian Church. God was pleased with this church. These are the missionary church, where Christians sent the gospel all over the world. From AD 1730 to 1900, now sadly, we are the age of the Laodicean Church, which is the apostate church, from 1900 to present day. Where the church were, we're starting to see a falling away, unfortunately. And each one of these different church ages I will go through in detail. But today it's the church in Ephesus, the apostolic church, which represents an age from AD 30 to 100. Now, before I start with the church in Ephesus, there's a delightful little story. It's an apocryphal story, which just means it's a story found in external text to the Bible. It may be true, it may not be true. It's not scripture, but it's got a nice thought to it. And this story helps me with a little example. It just gives it sets, the, it sets the tone for me. And this story tells us about a time when Jesus asked the disciples to each carry stones. Now, you don't read this in your Bible. This is just either man-made or maybe it's based on tradition. Who knows? But it was a time, apparently, when Jesus asked the disciples to each carry stones. I'd like you to carry a stone for me, Jesus advised his disciples, without any explanation why. The disciples looked around for a stone to carry, and Peter, you know, Peter being the practical sort, well, he found the smallest stone he could possibly find, a pocket-sized stone, no effort for him to carry. After all, Jesus never gave any, uh, any details or regulation or requirement about the weight and size of the stone, so why not? So Peter put it in his pocket, and later Jesus said, follow me, bring your stones. He led them on a journey, and at about noontime, Jesus sat everyone down, and he waved his hands, and he gave thanks, and all the stones turned into bread. He then said, it's time for lunch. And within a matter of seconds, well, Peter's lunch was over. He only had a tiny stone, it became a tiny piece of bread. Unlike some of the other disciples, Bartholomew, Thomas, who chose large stones, and they became large pieces of bread. 
When lunch was over, Jesus told them to stand up, and again, he asked them to carry a stone. Now Peter said, now I get it, and he found a huge stone, a boulder no less, and he hoisted it on his back. And although he was struggling and he found it painful, and he was lagging behind the other disciples, he managed to carry his big boulder on his back thinking about the tasty supper he was going to have later. Around supper time, Jesus then led them to the side of the river, and he said, Now, everyone, throw your stones into the water. Throw your stones into the water. And they did. And then he said, Follow me, and began to walk. Peter and the others looked dumbfounded. Jesus sighed, and he said to them, Do you remember what I asked you to do? Who were you carrying the stone for? And in this story, Peter, unfairly perhaps made the butt of a joke, but he's found on two occasions carrying the stone for himself, not for Jesus. The first time he's carrying the stone, he chose that stone because it required minimal effort. He could fit the stone in his pocket, no problem, easy life. The second time, he wasn't think, thinking of what Jesus asked him to do. He was thinking of his lunch, he was thinking of his tea, and he picked the biggest stone he could find. He wasn't carrying the stone for Jesus. He had forgotten his first love. And this fits us very nicely with the first epistle in Revelation, written to the church in Ephesus. Now, the church in Ephesus offers us a picture of the very end of the very first church during the latter part of the first century. Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Ar Artemis, or Artemis. And this temple provided a refuge, a safe place where criminals could flee to. It was a place where men would visit the temple priestesses and they would worship Artemis through sexual performances and, and other rituals. But, nevertheless, despite this, this, this huge temple in Ephesus, despite Ephesus being the epicentre of immorality, of corruption, of idolatry in the ancient world, God's church grew. Christians were able to worship and praise God, they evangelised, they saw converts, despite the darkness, despite the depravity of this city. Now, each of the seven churches has a unique name. Names, of course, are very important. Ephesus means desired. The name Ephesus means desired. This was God's desired church. The church of Ephesus, Ephesus had its zeal, it had resilience, it had uh, a love for the Lord which was desirable and this should encourage us all. No matter how far it seems that our community and our nation falls, our church can still thrive. Ephesus did after all. Christians can still grow. The lost can still be won. And now we've had a, a little bit of context, let's get into the nitty gritty of this, uh, this letter and start to look at it verse by verse. Verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. What a marvellous, exciting event. The Ephesian church, and they had a marvellous reputation, famous for its good works, famous for its efforts, and they had received a personal letter from the Lord. Excited they must have been, expecting, um, expecting recognition, expecting praise, perhaps for all their good works. Now, it's possible that the angel of the church in Ephesus, Ephesus could well have been a literal angel, it's possible, but it's more likely that this refers to the church pastor. Um, it would have been the pastor who would open and read the letter to the Ephesians, and the Greek word for angel is the same as the word for messenger. So it's probably the pastor who was given this letter who had the responsibility to shepherd this church. 
And it's important to note also that we are immediately told that Jesus walks among the seven golden lampstands. And this reminds us why it is so important to meet as a church, because Jesus is here. This imagery of walking among the golden lampstands would have been familiar to churches at this time, to Christians at this time, because it refers to the Old Testament, where Jesus is now compared to the high priest, who would walk uh, among the golden lampstands in, in the, the temple and, and would supply the church with the oil, which is representative here of the Holy Spirit. Verse 2. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Now verse 2 opens with a crucial observation. I know your works. Jesus knows he knows everything about us already. He knows our works. He knows what we've done which is good. He knows what we've done which is bad. He knows the motivations behind our works. He is fully aware of everything about us and everything which we are currently experiencing. He knows our sufferings. He knows our afflictions. He knows our weariness. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. Whatever you're going through right now, he knows. Jesus knows. And here at Bethany, Jesus knows our patient endurance. He remembers the cold mornings we spent on the high streets sharing the gospel. He knows the planning we did for the Alpha course, which then had to stop because of the lockdown. He knows the hard graft at the food bank. He knows the carol services and, and singing in Sainsbury. He knows what we've done and he knows what we've gone through. He knows when we've had people leave. He knows when things haven't gone how we wanted it to go or how we expected it to go. He knows. He knows everything. He knows and we shouldn't be discouraged that the church, that this church even, has not really grown as much this year as we wanted it to or hoped it would. But, you know, maybe we shouldn't even expect that necessarily. Because the Bible says one soul and another reaps. And that we should preach in and out of season. So don't be discouraged. No work is wasted. Um, noteworthy, it says... Um, the church of Ephesus was praised for testing those who called themselves apostles, and we're not. And as Christians, we must not be lazy. We must lovingly point others to Christ's example in all areas of, of life. And also, we should avoid believing everything we hear others tell us. We have to be wise, and we have to use Scripture as a measuring rod. We have to use Scripture to test everything. Even what I'm saying right now, don't just believe every word that comes out of my mouth. I make mistakes. Test it. Um, get your Bible, watch on YouTube after, and, and check it. Check everything I say against the Scriptures. Um, an example of this, for instance, very recently the Pope made comments endorsing same-sex marriage. And a lot of Christians did pick up on this, um, because obviously his comments... Um, were, were, were contradictory to what the scripture says. Uh, he said, homosexual people have the right to be in a family, they are children of God. Uh, what we have to have is a civil union law, that way they are legally covered. But I haven't noticed anyone, any Christian, who commented on what the Pope said, pick up on something else he said. A lot of people picked up on about the same-sex marriage, and obviously the Bible teaches that that's not the way for Christians, that's, that's going against the way God planned marriage to be, it's against God's design. But the Pope said they are children of God, and I think that slipped under the radar. I think a lot of Christians miss that comment, and that is very deceptive, and it's very, very uh, dangerous comment. Um, and this is a case, in my opinion, of actually the Pope not loving people enough to tell them the truth. 
Because the Bible doesn't teach that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us that we need to repent, and that is to turn your back on a sinful lifestyle. So everyone struggles with sin. Some people might struggle with, with lying, for example, but then when they repent, they say, I turn my back on that. But if you're in a homosexual relationship, you haven't turned your back on that. Now, some people, some Christians may struggle with same-sex attraction, and they say, okay, I'm Christian, I've turned my back on that life, from time to time I will make mistakes, but I'm going to try and live for God, I'm going to sacrifice my wants, my desires, they're crucified on the cross with Christ, I'm going to live for Christ in a way that honours and pleases Him. And we all slip up, but in that relationship, you've not repented, otherwise you wouldn't be in the relationship, would you? And do you know what the Bible says? It says in 1 John 3.10 that people who aren't Christian are actually children of the devil. And that when we become a Christian, we are adopted into the family of God. We are adopted into his family. We then become his children when we're born again, according to Romans 8.15. So the Ephesian church, the church in Ephesus, would have tested what the Pope said and found him to be false. And found what he said to be false because not everyone is a child of God. And that's the, the sad reality. Verse 3. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Some churches lack patience. Some Christians lack patience. Some churches grow weary. Well, some Christians grew weary. But the Ephesian church had endured patiently, and they had not grown weary. And this in itself deserves praise, and Jesus recognised this and commended the Ephesian church for this. And here at Bethany, we've endured through struggles, and, you know, I, I think we've, we've been faithful as well. And... And I, I think we can be encouraged that Jesus recognised that the Ephesian church hadn't lost patience, hadn't grown weary, and I think we too can find encouragement from that. Verse 4, But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. And this would have been a crushing blow, I suppose, to the Ephesian church. It would have been a warning to them. They abandoned their first love. And sometimes it can be so easy to become distracted. It can be so easy to be caught up in secondary issues that we can abandon our first love. And many churches uh, do fantastic works for charities, uh, for their communities. They fight brilliant social justice causes, but they abandon their first love. And other times churches can be so concerned with appearance that they abandon their first love. They get, they get the, the smoke machines, the flashing lights, they get all the latest technology and, and make it look amazing and it looks fantastic. But it becomes too much about appearance and they forget the reason for being the raison d'etre. There are two interpretations of Jesus' warnings. Um, I, I believe the first interpretation, um, but I'm gonna give you both of them for your knowledge. Um, the first interpretation is the most obvious, that the Ephesian church had lost its early love for Christ. Another interpretation is that they had lost love for one another, and they needed to revive the compassionate work. And, and maybe you could take a bit of both, actually. Um, but I think, predominantly, I think, really, the first love is the love for Christ. Because it says in Mark 12, 29-31, and 1 John, um, sorry, Mark 12, 12, 31 says, the, sec the second commandment is to love your neighbour. Jesus comes first. Jesus is the first lover. Um, but did you know the Greek word for first is also the same word translated as best in Luke 15.22? In Luke 15, 22, it uses the same Greek word here. So in that context, in that passage, it means best. So our love for the Lord must be our best love. And when it says your first love, we must give him our best. That's 
how we keep him as our first love, we keep him our best. Are you giving Christ your best, your very, very best? And I'm reminded at this point of four very well-known fishermen, Andrew and Peter and James and John. And Matthew 4, 18 to 22 says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, and he followed him. Sorry, and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the uh, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And notice the fishermen without any hesitation, they left what they were doing and they followed Jesus. They showed no sign of hesitation, no doubt, uh, no, oh, I'd better do this first, I've got, I've got to do this, then I'm going to do it. Jesus became their first love. They, they gave him their best and they gave him their, themselves. You know, they, they, they dropped everything to follow Jesus. Do you love Jesus enough to drop everything for him at a moment's notice? And when considered honestly, that's a very, very challenging thought, that very challenging question. And um, yesterday, as I was just reading over my notes again, I noticed something else interesting, and this is just a passing comment. Um, Andrew and Peter were casting their nets, and James and John were mending their nets. And I wonder, maybe for some time in the future, I might think about whether that there could be something implied there about Somebody's role might be to, 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 to bring in fish, if you like, to bring Christians men, mending their nets, maybe discipleship, maybe helping Christians um, grow in them. And that's just a thought I had, but I've not thought it through properly. <laughs> so that's something that I'll have to come back to at some point uh, and, give, and give some consideration there. Uh, verse 5. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, Jesus did diagnose their condition, that they had forgot their first love. But, he also gave the antidote. This in the news lately, we're hearing every day about a vaccine, uh, about a medicine, about a formula. Well, here Jesus gave the formula, the medicine, to the situation of losing or abandoning your first love. And you can remember that easily as the three R's. The three R's. Remember, repent, redo. Remember when you first became a Christian. Remember the love you had when you first met Jesus. Repent of losing that zeal and enthusiasm of putting things in Jesus' place. And then redo those works you did at first. And the seriousness of this formula is seen in the warning that follows, that if the church is not to take heed of this instruction, of this remedy of the three R's, Jesus would remove their lampstand, meaning they would both, uh, in the near future, and when Christ returns, they would lose their status as a church. And to my knowledge today, sadly, the Ephesian church is just rubble. In fact, you can go there, and it's just a few stones. Maybe, maybe that happened, maybe they had their lampstand removed, they lost their status as a church. Um, verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We don't know much about the Nicolaitans, actually. They are man mentioned again in verses 14 to 15, um, when we're talking about um, the church in Pergamum, which I'll come to in the future. Um, but, we, yeah, we don't know too much about the Nicolaitans. What, what we do know is they were a heretical uh, Christian sect. And from what verses 14 and 15 tell us, they seduced God's people into idolatry and sexual immorality, like the prophet Balaam. Um, and we'd have to go back 
I think, to Numbers to check the prophet Balaam and, and, and see what was going on there and compare it. But to sum up, idolatry, sexual immorality. Um, but they hated those words. And in a, in a postmodern world today, in an age of tolerance, it doesn't say you tolerated those words and I'm pleased about that. In fact, I've, I've searched every time tolerance is mentioned in the Bible, and every single time it's bad. There's no positive place in the Bible of tolerance being a good thing. Mm. This here, it says you hate the works of Nicolaitans. Mm. Um, we, we, we should put God first, love him so much that things contrary to scripture, we, we, we shouldn't want anything to do with it, really. Um, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now verse 7 is jam-packed. Lots of interesting information in this one verse, starting with he who has an ear. And we're reminded that the letter to the church of Ephesus, or in Ephesus, is for all people to hear. If you have an ear this morning, here. If you have an ear, here. This includes us today. Yet, although our angle, if you remember when I was looking at chapter 1, I mentioned about being in the right position. I mentioned about being, having the right angle, being in the right position to hear uh, from God's word. And if you remember when I spoke about that flamingo and how it has to change its head when it's eating from looking down, looking down your perspective of the word, to looking up to what's God's perspective. Well, our angle, our position must be right. We must use our ears to hear. Um, spiritual teachings tend to emphasise hearing before seeing. In chapter 1, verse 10, John heard the voice before he saw the vision. If our ears are dull, we cannot hear, then we're not going to see. In Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, it says, keep on hearing before it says, keep on seeing. In Romans, it says that faith comes from hearing. Interestingly, in Exodus 29 to 20, uh, the Israelites received instructions and it said, and you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right ears of his sons. Now, probably, and this is like the priestly people, probably because if they were covered in the garments, only the ears were exposed, so that's where you would put the blood. But that doesn't escape the fact that uh, the priest had to have their ears cleansed with the redeeming blood. So your ears are very important. You've got to hear the, hear the word, hear the, what the Lord says. The Lord then says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. At the beginning of each of the seven epistles recorded in chapters 2 and 3, it is the Lord who speaks. Yet at the end of each epistle, it is the Spirit who speaks for the churches. And this emphasises that in the darkness of the church's degradation, the spirit is vitally important. And finally, we notice that God will grant permission to eat of the tree of life to the one who conquers. As Christians, we must and we will have victory through Jesus who fights for us. And it's curious that we're granted permission, uh, we're granted to eat from the tree of life, because man-made religion teaches that we must strive and labour and toil. But Christianity teaches that God feeds us. He allows us to eat from the tree. And the Apostle Paul did the same thing in 1 Corinthians 3, 2. He fed the believers milk. He wanted to feed them bit better things, but he was feeding them. In order to grow as Christians, we must feed off the Lord. We must take his body and blood in communion. We eat the word like Ezekiel, and now we're promised to eat of the tree of life. I've just got a, a final thought. The Bible uses a very interesting word here for tree. In the Greek, it is the same word used in 1 Peter 2.24. And that verse says, 
he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So this is not the usual word in Greek for tree. This word symbolises the cross. So even here in this letter, letter to the Ephesians, we're getting the gospel. Even here, we're getting a reminder of Christ dying on the cross. Because they would have known, he's not talking about an old tree or whatever. He's not talking, he's reminding them of the cross, of what Jesus did for them. The crucified and resurrected Christ will himself be the tree of life for the nourishment of all God's redeemed people for eternity. The primary matter for the church here is to enjoy Christ as our life supply, as our food, that we become closer and closer to Christ, that we're learning from him every day, that we're eating the word every day, that he's our first and our best love. Where is the tree of life? It's in the paradise of heaven. Access to this tree in the Garden of Eden and to eternal life was forbidden after humanity's fall. The tree reappears in the New Jerusalem. Its roots are watered by the living water from God's throne. Its fruit will be a constant source of nourishment and its leaves will bring healing to the city's inhabitants whose names appear in the Lamb's Book of Life. So Christ provides our every need. He fills us with nourishment, he teaches us, he encourages us, he grows us, he knows everything you're going through. He's, he's, he gives us life and life to the full. To summarise, as Christians we are promised access to the tree of life and paradise and we're reassured that Christ knows everything we are going through. He knows our hard works, he knows our toil, he knows our labour, our suffering, but we must not become complacent. We must not forsake our first love. And this letter to the church in Ephesus reminds us that Jesus is the centre of our lives. That we, are, that we should be focused on serving him. And even now with COVID-19, we still have a unique opportunity to, to tell people why we're not fearful. Why our trust, our confidence is in Jesus. And if today you think, well, maybe I've abandoned my first love. Don't despair. Remember the formula. Remember the three R's. Re remember the love you had for God. Repent of losing that zeal um, and redo those first works you did when you became a Christian. So, um, next time at all, whenever that will be, we'll do the, the church. Um, I forgot which one it is now. Is it the Sardis? Smyrna. Smyrna. Smyrna, it is. Good one, Bernie. I knew it was an S. Uh, next time we're doing Smyrna, uh, where, when, when that will be. Uh, but Ephesus today, the apostolic church, full zeal, keep that zeal for Christ. Okay, I'll just pray to finish. Thank you, Father, that we have access to the tree of life because of what you did for us on that cross, Lord. We, we can be forgiven through the blood shed for us on that cross, Lord. And we remember you did Lord and today we're, we're sorry Lord for where we have forgotten where we have abandoned our first love and today Lord we remember everything you've done for us Lord and we repent of losing our zeal and we repent Lord of, of not putting you where you should be of not giving you our best and Lord we, we're going to redo that we're going to, 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 to start to give you our best our first love we're going to make you king again Lord and we Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us, and thank you for keeping us in this difficult time, and thank you that you know our sufferings, you know the difficulty we're having, and that you love us, Lord, you provide for us, you care for us, and we pray, Lord, that you bless us and grow us, Lord, give us the courage and the confidence to serve you and to tell people all about you, Lord. Thank you for this letter, and even though it was addressed to the church in Ephesus all that time ago, nearly 2,000 years ago, Lord, we know that it applies today for us, Lord, and is still relevant to us through your living word, Lord. Amen. Amen.